feet. Varshati, Varshati, pouring, pouring. Sma, Sma, used to, used to. Yatakaman, Yatakaman, as much as one can desire, as much as one can desire. Parjanyaha, Parjanyaha, water, water. Eva, Eva, like, like. Tarpayan, Tarpayan, pleasing. Easy. Samudraha, Samudraha, the sea, the sea. Eva, Eva, likened, likened. Durbodha, Durbodha, not understandable, not understandable. Satvena, Satvena, by existential position, by existential position. Achala, Achala, the hills, the hills. Rat Eva, Rat Eva, like the king of, like the king of. Translation and purport by his divine grace, Sri Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Just as rainfall satisfies everyone's desires, Maharaj Pritu used to satisfy everyone. He was like the sea, in that no one could understand his depths, and he was like Meru, the king of hills, in the fixity of his purpose. Purport. Maharaj Pritu used to distribute his mercy to suffering humanity, and it was like rainfall after excessive heat. The ocean is wide and expansive, and it is very difficult to measure its length and breadth. Similarly, Pritu Maharaj was so deep and grave that one, uh, that no one could fathom his purposes. The hill known as Meru is fixed in the universe as a universal pivot, and no one can move it an inch from its position. Similarly, no one could ever dissuade Maharaj Pritu when he was determined. Translation. Just as the rainfall satisfies everyone's desires, Maharaj Pritu used to satisfy everyone. He was like the sea, and that no one could understand his depths, and he was like Meru, the king of hills, in the fixity of his purpose. So this is a very beautiful and poetic presentation of the glories of the great Mahajan, great authority, in devotional service, Maharaj Pritu. Such devotees, true devotees, are uh, representatives of Krishna in this world. So, in fact, this very descriptive glorification that he is like rainfall to satisfy everyone's desires He's like the sea in which no one can trace his depths. He's like Meru, the great universal mountain, because he's so fixed and immovable in his purpose. Actually, these uh, descriptions originally pertain to Lord Krishna himself. But naturally, the pure devotee embodies these same qualities because the pure devotee is so intimately connected with Lord Krishna. Uh, we find Srila Prabhupada uh, in his activities exhibits these identical features of Lord Krishna's own nature. I was just thinking as I read this about uh, when Srila Prabhupada, in this, not, yes, not so long before he left this planet, 76, I think, he was in Bombay. And uh, at that time, you may know there was one, uh, and he's still, oh, he's dead now, but there was one bogus guru, quite famous, very famous. And uh, this organization still exists, still attracts people. They wear orange cloth. <laughs> and uh, so he had his, this bogus guru had his headquarters at that time in this city in Maharashtra called Pune. And this was, the city is not that far from Bombay. And initially, this guru, well, we could say initially he started off 
and he was, uh, he just, I, I believe he just started off with the uh, appellation Shri in front of his name. And then it became uh, Acharya, and then it became Bhagavan, <laughs> as time went on. <laughs> so, first he was just someone a bit important, then he became Acharya, world teacher, and then after a few more years he became God. <laughs> but his uh, message to the world was uh, spiritual attainment or liberation through uh, the most gross and provocative kinds of sense gratification, sex life especially. <laughs> and so naturally, he attracted many followers. Uh, that is easy to do in this age, if one has sense gratification to offer. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say, if you throw rice on the ground, so many crows will come. So if you supply sense gratification, you can get many, many followers. Initially, uh, this person's followers were from the West, mainly from the West, coming to India. Because Indians would not, Indians were shocked by what this person was proposing to be spiritual life. But gradually, uh, you see, especially because that area, Bombay area, uh, is the center of the film industry of India. So there are many actors who is, you know, have lots of money and the life of an actor is known to tend in the direction of degradation. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they became attracted also, got involved with this person, and whatever actors do, then common people will also try to follow. So in time, uh, Indians, especially those from the more wealthy section, were also flocking to that place in Pune. So it so happened in 76 that one woman, uh, life member lady, she came to see Shil but she was very upset because a close relative of hers, I believe it was a son, not exactly sure, but anyway, close relative of hers had taken up with this fellow in Pune and become a disciple. And she was a you know, traditional Hindu lady and was also connected with this God and therefore respecting Srila Prabhupada as a pure devotee. And in her simple way she came to Prabhupada to lament about this relative going to that rascal. And she begged Prabhupada, please do something. It's a kind of you know, simple faith that she would talk about your pure devotee and mm. Krishna uh, acts through you. So please do something. And Srila Prabhupada, he reassured her by saying, yes, I will go to that place Puna, and drive him out, meaning that rascal. I will drive him out of his position. Mm -hmm. So she was very reassured. But, uh, of course, this was 76, so she left the planet in 1977 without having done that. So this then might bring to mind that, oh, maybe Prabhupada was just being diplomatic. Here was a woman on his doorstep who was crying and wanted something to be done. And he just said this to her to reassure her so that she would go away happy. And then he put it out of his mind <coughs> and then left the planet without having done it. So someone from, you know, with material vision might see it like that. But here, we read that one of the qualities of the Mahajana, the pure devotee, is that he is like the sea and that no one can understand his depths. Um, 
and like the rainfall, it satisfies everyone's desires. And like Meru, he is firmly fixed in his purpose. And these qualities extend beyond just this visible existence that we now see. So uh, it so happened that uh, a few years later, early 80s, that um, because this person in Pune had become very, his, his uh, notoriety, say, that means the fame which is not born of good deeds, but <laughs> of uh, you know, more sensational kinds of deeds. So his fame had spread everywhere in India. And <coughs> so newspaper reporters were coming to get a good story. It's a good story to interview this person. <coughs> uh, either people are interested or people are shocked in that story, but it will generate a lot of attention. And so, in the course of talking with him, uh, some reporter asked him, what do you think of uh, Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement? So, because this person, of course, his, his whole process was based on illicit sex life. And Prabhupada had so straightforwardly and without any concern with the conventions of modern time had rejected illicit sex life as having no possible connection to spiritual life. So, uh, therefore this rascal guru, he blasphemed Prabhupada. And with great glee, the reporters reported it in the newspaper. It became a big story. And naturally, reporters wanting a story, they came to Bombay Temple, uh, and uh, a Juhu, and uh, asked some representative of Iskand there, so what do you have to say about so-and-so's statements about your Guru Maharaj? And so you know how devotees are. <laughs> yeah, when they're confronted with such kind of blasphemy, so then Rajneesh was denounced by Iskand, and that went in the newspapers. And then, eagerly, the reporters went back to Rajneesh to get the response. And so the newspapers, back and forth, this war of words was building up. So, uh, in other words, what had happened was, is that, whereas previously this Rajneesh was, I don't mention his name, <laughs> the person was, uh, content with his own sinful activities. <coughs> now he had directly involved Srila Prabhupada. So we, it can be understood as Prabhupada had said to this lady, I will personally come to Pune. So Prabhupada, in that sense, personally come to Pune even after he had departed. And Prabhupada said, I will drive him out. So it so happened that at this time also the Indian government was investigating this person, investigating his financial dealings. And he came to know about it because he was very well connected. He had also connections in government. So he came to know that his uh, financial dealings, he's very wealthy, and so much money pouring in from rich disciples. So India, with Indian government, was very concerned about this and was investigating and was preparing a raid, a uh, raid by the Treasury Department, the Revenue Service, uh, to seize uh, illicitly gathered funds. Um, so, coming to know this, this person departed suddenly in the night, I think it was, something like that, you know, overnight, the whole place was empty, and he left, and he went to the West. So, indeed, uh, Srila Prabhupada did drive him out, because this happened at the same time as the blasphemy. And then, very famously, he went 
to Oregon and set up a, a big Purim there. But that also, he could not find any <laughs> peace there either. The American government became interested in him. And he was finally driven out from that place, uh, captured and jailed and humiliated. Uh, and then he returned to India. And not long after all that, he died in great misery. So indeed, we can see that what might appear to ordinary vision as just some reassuring words of Srila Prabhupada, just there's a distraught woman here, and you have to say something to send her on her way. <laughs> Happily, so that she'll be pacified. Uh, but actually, they turned, those, these words turned out to be prophetic. Uh, so this, is, this came to mind as, as I was reading this, that Srila Prabhupada the perfect example of a pure devotee, like rainfall, satisfies everyone's desires. Like the sea, you cannot understand these activities, you see. What you can understand in the sea is what you see on the surface. But below it is so vast, and so much is happening there, we don't know. And then, like the king of hills, Meru, which is the pivot of the whole, the axle, the central up-down uh, axle of the whole universe. There's the whole, the whole thing is turning. Uh, so, an axle of such a vast uh, machinery as the cosmos itself must be so fixed and so firm and so strong in its situation. Any questions? Yes. Uh, he's asking what is humility and uh, how can you practice it? Is humility? And how can you practice it? You speak of humble servant. Uh, actually, you cannot, it's not conceivable to divorce humility from uh, servitude, being a servant. So humility is the attitude that um, makes a servant a genuine servant. There are servants that you can hire for money, and because they are interested in money, they will do their service, they will say, yes sir, no sir, and appear to be humble, but they're not, because if you don't pay them, they're out the door in a second. <laughs> so, that is not real humility. Uh, so real humility means that without material uh, uh, remuneration, as I say, without material benefit coming, uh, one uh, submits himself to the Master, lives only for the satisfaction of the Master, uh, dedicates himself to carrying out the Master's order. So this is how we know what is real humility. It has to be pra uh, manifest practically in service, unmotivated service. So, uh, and by this definition, then someone who is, as I was alluding to last night also, in the preaching mission. Someone can be humble yet at the same time appear by other estimation to be, well, some people even think he's puffed up. Uh, why? Because he's so firm in the principles set down by the Master. You know, just like uh, even in the material world, if uh, an important man has a bodyguard, so the bodyguard is there to protect him. He's a, he's a servant. But in the course of doing that protection, uh, although he's a servant, he can act very bossy to other people, you know, because he's a bodyguard. So he 
pushes people out of the way and uh, he orders people to leave. It gets very heavy. <laughs> you see? But these people, big important people, they, there's so many reporters and uh, fans and like that or just you know crazy people <laughs> who want to enter their life and you know, make themselves known and something. And so the bodyguard has a, has a big task. Uh, and sometimes he has to deal with these people in a, in a very you know, abrupt way, very strong way. But uh, nobody minds that. I mean, of course, that the person that's being dealt with minds it, but, but the public doesn't mind it because they understand. Uh, he's the servant. He's doing this to protect the big man, the big woman. Uh, he's not just doing it on, on his own. He's not like a bully, a heavy guy. But he's doing it on behalf of another person. So, this, so in this way, a, a devotee also, a devotee is genuinely a servant because he's not like these bodyguards for uh, material rewards in return. But in his service, he may also superficially appear to be uh, proud or arrogant or pushy or whatever. But if he's actually doing everything for Krishna, very good. Uh, we gave the example of Srila Prabhupada for this person. If he's actually doing everything for Krishna, then he can even drive someone out of his position, whatever. Uh, for the sake of the Lord, and that is glorious. Just as Maharaj Prithu also, he was ready to uh, sacrifice, to kill the personified earth in the form of a cow, uh, for the sake of his duty to the Lord. Now this is, on one level, appears to be uh, you know, a very abominable activity. How can he do that? It's supposed to be a representative of God, king, uh, follower of Dharma, how can he kill a cow? But when you judge the whole circumstances as presented in the Bhagavatam, because the, the cow, uh, she was not yielding her bounties to the population, and it is Maharaj Pritu's duty to the Lord to protect the population. We read that every day. So therefore he was even prepared to kill Mother Earth in the form of a cow and cut her up, up and serve her flesh, her body, to the people. Then she surrendered. And she explained also why she had been holding back because of sinful people on the earth. So, but this is real humility. Service attitude, genuine service attitude. And apart from this, you cannot judge what is, you know, people are tricky in this world just because someone is bowing, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, no sir, yes sir, no sir. It does not really mean that they're being, so, you know, if you, too much humility, Prabhupada says, it's a sign of a thief. <laughs> <laughs> yes sir, yes sir, but he's stealing from you, you don't know it, and you don't think that he may be stealing from you because... He seems so compliant, so humble. <laughs> so, this is the only standard by which we can know who is truly humble in terms of selfless service. Any other questions? Yeah. You must have the other that when you go to Delhi, you to fulfill and tell the stars, you can uh, they will just regenerate it again and again. If you go to Krishna, so what does it mean that the desire is fulfilled? What is the blessing? What is it? Yeah, the desire is fulfilled means that uh, uh, because we're taking desire to mean, of course, desires originally come from the soul, but when we say material desires, we're talking about a uh, misconception that I can only become happy by such and such material arrangement, material facility being provided. And uh, he's very attached to that. This is the, sh 
what is sometimes called in, in psychology uh, the shadow self. And we used to have a simple <laughs> term, ahankara, false ego. <laughs> but the shadow self or the ahankara is the person that we think we are in our conditioned state. And that person that we think we are has so many desires. And we think if these desires are not satisfied, then I cannot be happy. And the whole thing is a sham. It's an illusion. That, that shadow self is a good analogy. Yeah? Just like the shadow is not me. I have a shadow, but it is not me. But if for some crazy reason I start to identify with my shadow and think that this shadow is more important than my actual body, you know, then I would be going through uh, so many artificial activities to try to satisfy the shadow. Unnecessary activities. So it is like that. So a person who is very much under the influence of the shadow self, even after he takes the devotional service, their desires focused on that shadow self, uh, which he feels, unless they're taken care of, they cannot be happy. He tries to shake them off, and he maybe knows theoretically that, you know, this is Maya, but anyway, what can I do? They're there. But Krishna is very kind. Uh, so, uh, Krishna will provide, uh, even for those desires, but in a way that we are cured of having those desires. You see, this is the, uh, this is the meaning of Krishna actually satisfying the desire. So the desire is a diseased state of consciousness. So, you know, well, you know, it's just like uh, an example of sugared medicine. There's some sugar there that you'll take the medicine. Uh, you turn to the, you have a desire, so you turn to the Lord. So that's medicine. Materialists don't like to turn to the Lord because they are materialists. They want to imitate the Lord. They want to enjoy like Him. So one who turns to the Lord, then this is like a sick person seeking treatment, seeking medicine. But still he has these strong desires, so the medicine is served to him flavored. You know, there's some, it won't be so bitter. They'll still get, they'll still have the uh, experience of satisfying their particular desire. It tastes sweet, but the medicine acts nonetheless, devotional service. He's worshiping the Lord. But there is some, as you said, quoted that verse, sarva kama, some kama is there, some desire is there. But on a deeper level, okay, on a, on a superficial level, the desire is being satisfied in the sense that the, the thing that he wants is being provided. But on a deeper level, the very uh, cause of that material desire, the misdirection of spiritual desire, is being rectified. So then, it is like with Juba Maharaj, good example. Then the devotee gives up the desire. The desire, to have that desire eventually for the devotee becomes a big trouble. Why, why, why? You know, the devotee thinks, why am I wasting my time with it? So it's so troublesome to even think about this business. So I just give it up. I just worship Krishna. Whereas, uh, with demigod, you cannot have such a relationship like that. Demigods are representatives of, they're Krishna's representatives, but uh, they, they represent his uh, uh, control over the material nature. They do not represent his eternal transcendental aspect. Inseparables, Supreme Personality of Godhead who dwells within one's heart is waiting for us to surrender to Him. So when one approaches demigods and it is simply for material benefit, there is no deeper medicinal effect. 
demigods will provide if you worship them. And uh, for a short time, you think that you're satisfied with that thing, but then the desire will come back. And one will again return to the demigods, asking for something else, asking for something else, asking for something else. And uh, renunciation never develops. Purification never develops. And this demigod worship becomes degraded as a result. Initially, it's offered. It's offered for materialistic people to, to take up dharma. They take up some kind of worship. And the hope is, is that by entering into the realm of dharma, even for purely materialistic results, that by entering into the realm of dharma by association, they, they, they will visit temples, they will, uh, for piety, they may hear from sadhus associate, try to serve sadhus also because it is in the scriptures that this is good to do. So the hope is, is that they will become a little more intelligent and then take up the worship of Vishnu and Vaishnava. But if not, uh, they're so mercenary they can see, oh, actually only, why worship anyone else except Lord Shiva, because he's giving the real thing I want. So if they're so, if that is their intelligence, then they will become degraded. Yes? So, from this connection, it seems that they actually are not seeking the satisfaction of their desire or fulfillment, that they simply want to go on with this desire. Yeah, well, that's what they think is satisfaction. This is the material condition. <coughs> we take the embarrassment, Prabhupada said the soul is embarrassed by non-manifestation. But we take that embarrassment, embarrassed state as being desirable. You see? We, in other words, we are, you know, the materialistic person is uh, seemingly content to relinquish his spirituality, his, his uh, spiritual position, and enter into the whirlpool of material existence in pursuit of some very fleeting benefits. So this is a this is craziness. Uh, therefore, Narottam Das compares it to drinking poison. Drinking poison in knowledge that this is poison. People do that, you know, like alcohol. <laughs> this is poison, <coughs> but still they drink it and they know it. Cigarette smoking, it is poisonous. And everybody knows it, but still, they do it. <laughs> so many, you know, see these illicit activities? They're, uh, even from material point of view, or to speak of uh, the welfare of the soul, but just for the welfare of the material body, the material mind, these activities are, are very dangerous. But still, they do them. So what else can you say? Except just, you know, our time, this is, is comparing this to the activities of a crazy person. That's the only way you can explain this. You cannot find in the ultimate end any logical reason for it. There's no logical explanation. Just like a person smoking. Sir, why do you smoke? Well, I like it. But it gives you disease. Anyway, it doesn't matter. See, that's their, their philosophy is live dangerously. <laughs> and the recent cigarette advertisements, that's what they, that's, they, because there's been so much anti-cigarette propaganda, so they capitalize on this now. Live dangerously. <laughs> you know, the, the, the cigarette smoker always looks like a hero or a heroine. You know, <laughs> before they were just looking like happy people, normal people, but now they always are, <laughs> this kind of look like a heavy person who's mm -hmm. ready to go out. Isn't it? 
<laughs> face danger, climb a mountain with bare hands, or <laughs> these kind of things. Shri Prabhupada ki jai, Shri Prabhupada ki jai.